Chapter 23, The Eastern Slavs. So here we are, final chapter in the unit. Now the early Eastern Slavs, around 500 AD, a group of Slavs, which is just the name of the, the people, settled in the Volga River, uh, or by the Volga River. Their, their families owned their land, but the seed, animals, and tools were owned by the village. The oldest man governed with the help of a council, so hopefully the oldest man was someone who was pretty good at governing. Otherwise, I think you were in trouble. Now, they used slash and burn uh, technique to make farmland, which meant that they cut down the trees by going ahead and burning them, more or less, and then they uh, were able to farm afterwards on that land. This method was not efficient because the farmers had to move often because once they burned the land, or burned the, the trees, then they weren't fertile anymore, that land, so they had to move a lot. As they moved east, they found forests and used timber to build izbas, which are these houses, sort of like an example over here, and um, to uh, build boats and also create musical instruments. People worshipped many gods that affected the different areas of life, and the Eastern Slavs used rivers for transportation and then for trade routes, and if you go back for a second here, you can see lots of rivers all over the place. Now, towns grew up around the major rivers. The most important trade route was something called the Varangian route. That went mainly over rivers from the Baltic Sea to, the Con to Constantinople. And again, if you look here, you can see this goes all the way down here. This would be the example of the Varangian route here, right here. This purple one, this is another trade route as well. So to protect trade routes, uh, the Eastern Slavs hired the Vikings, which is called the Varangians, who eventually became a part of the Eastern Slav population, so they sort of merged with the group that was there. And this is the, the Rus states that we'll get to in a minute. Kievan Rus. Now, for in uh, 862 AD, a Varangian, so a Viking named Rurik, became the prince of a town on the northern part of the Varangian route called Novgorod. And that's up here somewhere. Later, a friend Rurik of Rurik called Oleg established an area called Kievan Rus, which I'll refer to as KR in the actual written portion of the of the video from now on. And to the south with the capital of Kiev uh, at at its center. Now Kiev was on the Varangian route on the Dnieper River, so it was important to trade. The leader of Kievan Rus was the Grand Prince of Kiev, and he ruled many smaller territories with the help of land-owning nobles who were called boyars. And Avesh helped to solve problems, and that's just an assembly. Any man who was free could call an assembly meeting. So that's pretty democratic on some level. Vladimir I and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, Vladimir I was an important ruler of, of Kiev who expanded the territories. His biggest influence was that he made Eastern Orthodoxy uh, uh, the uh, official religion of Kiev and Rus. And by choosing this, he allied themselves himself with the Byzantines and separated from Western Europe. Because if he allied himself, if he converted to Roman Catholicism, they might have been more aligned with uh, Western Europe. But he allied himself with uh, the Byzantines instead. Now, Kiev and Rus got a lot of ideas from the Byzantines and adopted the Cyrillic alphabet, alphabet and architectural styles from them. And there's the good old story about how Vladimir decided because he invited different people in to convince him who or what religious faith he should have. And a Jew, a Muslim, and a someone from Eastern Orthodoxy came in. And the Jew uh, was v uh, viewed as a defeated people. That's what Vladimir said. So I can't go ahead and do that. You guys don't even have a homeland. The Muslims, he uh, liked to drink, apparently, or uh, liked wine, and Muslims prohibited from drinking wine or alcohol. So he went with uh, Christianity, the Eastern Orthodox Church, because partially because he saw how beautiful Hagia Sophia is. At least that's this story. Yaroslav the Wise. Now, Yaroslav the Wise was the son of Vladimir I, and he took over after a battle with his brothers. Again, battling with the brothers. Always seems to come down to that. Kiev grew very large and more educated under him. That's why he's called the Wise. And a new law code was established where most, most of the punishments were fines. Eventually, Kievan Rus declines, though, because Yaroslav dies, and there's frequent fighting over who should be the new ruler. 
because everyone was paying attention to the internal fighting, borders were not protected, trade was disrupted, and the decline of the Byzantine Empire also affected Kievan Rus. Many people left and moved north to escape invasions from different people. In 1240, a group called the Mongols came in, and they invaded the area around Kievan Rus and a lot of other areas too. And uh, there were these great warriors on horseback, and very intimidating. Uh, they were able to fire bows on horseback, and very good at that. So the people in Kievan Rus had to serve in the Mongol armies and to pay a tribute to the Khan. The Church Eastern Orthodox remained uh, faith remained strong during the Mongol period. Basically, the Mongols didn't really care what your religion was, provided you paid them lots of money. People started to fear foreigners because of the way the Mongols treated them, though. They did not treat them very well. Some changes from Eastern Orthodox uh, occurred because of isolation due to the Mongols, because they weren't able to uh, meet up with the Byzantines and other groups as well. But there was uh, rich and poor continued to have a lot of different lives. Uh, again, just standard sort of stuff in the early Middle Ages. The rise of Moscow. People moving away from the Mongols went north, and a lot of them ended up by in, in Moscow by its Kremlin, which is the fortress. Princes of Moscow worked well with the Mongols. They were able to get the power to tax the territories and under the Mongols uh, for the Mongols, and then they were supposed to turn over that money. If a territory did not pay Moscow, then Moscow took it over, and, and then they paid the tax to the Mongols for that, but this is how they started to expand. It's a very famous cathedral, uh, St. Basil's Cathedral, with a very unique architectural style, the onion domes there. In Moscow, the son of the dead leader would take over, so it was peaceful. There wasn't a whole lot of fighting, uh, so the son would take over. Metropolitan of Eastern Orthodox lived in Moscow as well, so it was a religious center. Eventually, Moscow became more powerful than the Mongols, who were fighting amongst themselves at that point. So Moscow was able to get them to leave and stay further east. Ivan the Great. Now, Ivan the Great expanded uh, Moscow's control to the east and to the north and defeated the Mongols. He also married the niece of the last Byzantine emperor and tried to make Moscow a center of the Orthodox Christian faith. He became very powerful over both the church and the people and was called Tsar in honor of sort of the Caesar, uh, just like uh, the Byzantines and the Romans called their leaders Caesar at certain points. Ivan the Terrible. When Ivan the Great died, his son Ivan the Terrible was only three, so a group of nobles called Boyars ruled for him until he was ready. The Boyars wanted more power, so they abused him, not physically, but just they didn't sort of ignore him. And so he did not like Boyars and when he took over at the age of 16. He took advice from his friends and from merchants instead of the Boyars. He, Ivan the Terrible, terrible started uh, to make it illegal for peasants to leave the land and rewarded his advisors with land. And this is a crest of him. He's able to defeat the Mongols, who emerge again partially because uh, he has gunpowder. When, when he loses a territory called Livonia, he blamed the Boers and he basically said, you know what, I can't handle with ruling with you guys, so I'm going to go ahead and live in a monastery instead. So he tries to give up the throne, but the people wanted him to rule because they were afraid what would happen without a strong leader. You know, back to the days of internal fighting. He returned, but uh, when he put into place the Oprichina, he uh, went ahead and this is basically the secret police they used to attack his enemies, particularly the boyars who caused him problems. The Oprichina, Oprichina, Oprichina went ahead and helped Ivan the Terrible to destroy the boyars' political power and terrorize the countryside and some of this. Uh, I like to think of them as sort of those black riders from the Lord of the Rings series the Nazgul on some level. You saw these guys coming, you got out of the way and ran. Ivan the Terrible is known as Ivan the Awesome to his own people and he was looked upon as a great ruler. But Ivan, in, and he, he increased the Tsar's power and encouraged learning from Western Europe. When Ivan died, there was not a good person to take over because Ivan had killed his oldest son in a fit of rage. And his middle son was feeble-minded, which means basically he was not uh, mentally capable of ruling. His youngest son was only three. Uh, 
So for 25 years after his own death, there was disorder and confusion. And we are done.